wanted to post a uh, a video up on um, <clears throat> on Canvas about um, how the U.S. dollar has been performing recently, and um, that will tie into what we're going to talk about in chapter uh, in this chapter here, uh, chapter four. So um, you'll see an article there if you want to take a look at that. I also uh, have posted um, the um, video with Elizabeth Warren. I tried it one more time today to try to get it to play in here. I don't know. They told me to do certain things that didn't seem to make any kind of a difference. So um, so we're going to give that up, and we're going to go ahead and uh, just let you look at that on your own on uh, Canvas. Uh, we're going to finish the slides for Chapter 4, get into exchange rates, and then we should be able to get through all the slides for Chapter 5. Uh, next time, uh, what I'm going to be doing is posting up a uh, practice midterm um, so that we can take a look at that and go through that prior to our actual midterm, which will be uh, two weeks from today on the uh, on October, what, uh, 18th or whatever. Okay, so um, that is coming up, so I think we should start to take some time to review what we've talked about so far since we've gone through quite a few concepts, make sure we're comfortable with some of the key terms, et cetera, so that we can uh, – do well on the exam, uh, which will be on the 18th, okay? So be looking on Canvas, um, and I'll try to put that up a little sooner than the start of the day here, which I've been doing with some of these others. Uh, chapter 5 is up there. I'm going to put the Chapter 5 file um, for the quiz questions. I forgot to do that, but I'll put that up as well. So the midterm will co cover uh, Chapters 1 through 5, 1 through 5, okay? Okay, questions on that? All right, so let's just go ahead and let's start to talk about exchange rates where we left off on Chapter 4. Okay, we tend to think of exchange rates in, in terms of the U.S. currency to other foreign currencies. And uh, you hear the discussion, you know, what is the strength of the dollar at any point in time? And so we talk about often a strong dollar versus a weak dollar. If we have a strong dollar, that means that the USD, the US dollar, the US currency is in demand and it is relatively strong against other currencies. So what happens if uh, another currency, someone who has, uh, you know, British pound, uh, Chinese yuan, whatever, want to acquire U.S. dollars, they have to give up more of their currency to acquire the U.S. dollar. Okay, so um, U.S. dollar is strong if the other country has to give up more of their currency to acquire the dollar. Weaker dollar means that the other country would have to give up what less of their currency, the other person holding the currency of another country would have to give up less of their currency if they wanted to acquire U.S. dollars. So what happens? Is a strong dollar good or is it a bad thing? Is a weak dollar good or is it a bad thing? It depends on what type of business you're in. If you are in the import business, if you're in the import business, you want the dollar to be what? to be relatively strong so that what? So that now more dollars buy more of the foreign currency, that makes those foreign goods easier to acquire, relatively cheap. And um, you can then lower the price of those foreign items or you can do what? You can keep the excess profit that's generated from that, right? If you are an exporter, Okay, you're exporting U.S. goods. You want the dollar to be what? Relatively weak because what's going to happen? We're going to sit there and the person holding the other denomination can acquire the U.S. dollars more easily at a relatively cheaper price. It's going to be easier for you to sell your goods abroad. So it really depends on whether you're an importer or an exporter as to how you root for the changes in the dollar. Okay, now uh, just to give us a little bit of sense as to, come on, the thing just worked two seconds ago, I swear. Okay, so to give us a little bit of sense as to how those could move, <laughs> it gets ponderous after a while, guys, it really does. 
somebody was sitting there watching me. I just made the thing change two seconds ago. With it. Now it's going to go ahead and play a little game. So That's why we travel. Sometimes people ask me, why is your bag always so full? And it's like, because I have to ward off every potential evil spirit of those things that won't work. So I have to carry a whole traveling bag of backups. Let's see if this works. Okay. Okay, there's no rhyme or reason for that, but we're going to go ahead and try and advance the slides here. So we got a locked up computer, is that what it is? No, we're just not letting anything advance from the keyboard. There it goes, let's see if that... Uh, unfroze it okay okay so we're back okay so all i did here was um i put in uh, i went to a currency converter and just was messing around with this and obviously u.s dollar is one for one right okay but if you were trying to acquire british pounds if you gave up a dollar you would get 77 uh cents or, or they call them pence, I guess, in uh, in the U in the uh, in the English currency. Okay, so um, you'd have to give up a dollar to get a little less than a pound. Okay, if we're dealing with the German mark, you give up a dollar, you get a little more than a mark. So this is the way uh, we look at uh, exchange rates. Okay, if you've traveled to foreign countries, I'm sure. You've dealt with this before, and you always have to get used to some countries have a tremendously different rate, right? The pound's pretty close to the dollar. The mark's pretty close to the dollar. You go to Italy, I think the lira is like, you know, it's something like 7 lira or 11 lira or something to a dollar, and all of a sudden you're paying, you know, $11,000 for a pair of shoes or 11,000 lira for a pair of shoes, and you have to get used to that. So uh, that's the way um, the exchange rates work, and they have these currency converters. Okay. Now, um, I did look up, and what I just posted up on uh, on uh, Canvas is how the U.S. dollar is performing against, and uh, the one that I was particularly interested in was the pound, because I was trying to see how this uh, uh, exit of uh, Britain from the European Union is affecting their currency, and the uh, the pound is down. It is down as a result of that. Uh, and uh, the U.S. dollar is relatively strong versus the pound, and it's been increasing. Uh, the dollar has been increasing in strength lately, and part of what they were speculating in that article that I posted up there is that the potential increase in U.S. interest rates could drive up uh, the uh, dollar as well. So dollar seems to be increasing uh, in strength right now. Okay, now this idea of exchange rates then lead us into the question of trade deficit trade surplus okay and you hear a lot about the US trade deficit okay that means that US exports are less compared to US imports so we're importing more things than we're exporting so we are said to have a trade deficit and we pretty much have a trade deficit with every country and you look at some of our largest trading partners um, and uh, you can see some of these here near the top, China, Mexico, Canada. Uh, and you take a look at the uh, trade deficit with these different countries, and it is pretty significant uh, with China. And I think, again, not that I want to turn this class into a Donald Trump uh, discussion, but I seem to keep mentioning him because he's in the news a lot. He keeps talking about the uh, trade deficit with China, with Mexico, and how that gives the U.S. certain leverage when it comes to negotiating. Remember, we talked about some of the trade deals and that sort of thing, which I think that would provide a relative amount of strength okay now we look at this a lot and we say oh the trade deficit and you know the u.s and i think to myself well you know what's causing this um in part i think it is the cheaper um you know production of goods because remember our factors of production labor being one of the key ones is coming relatively uh 
you know, relatively cheaper from some of these places than you would have in the U.S. But also, we are a uh, consumer society to a certain extent in that uh, we have vast amounts of, you know, of wealth in this country and we consume a lot of the products that are made in some of these other countries so that's probably uh, contributing to the trade deficit as well but we certainly do have a, a trade deficit uh, with with I think almost every country we trade with okay now uh, oh on the previous slide here we talk about exchange rate systems and we talked about uh, we talk about fixed versus freely floating. Freely floating is just letting the economies of the markets determine what the exchange rates will be at any point in time. In most countries, we'll have a freely floating, but some countries have a fixed or a set uh, exchange rate, meaning that the central bank of that country will try to uh, do uh, make steps that will try to fix the exchange rates and uh, lately in the news, China has been talked about quite a bit as one that tries to fix the rate. So I put this little article in here just to give us a sense as to what happens. And uh, all they're talking about here is that U.S. dollars would be flowing into China to try to build, say, a plant in China, right? Expanding uh, their operations in China. They're going to build a plant. As a result, there will be a demand for the Chinese yuan because they are trying to acquire Chinese currency to pay for the Chinese uh, you know, uh, development of a factory in China, in China, the materials that would have to be bought for that, the labor, etc. So that demand for the Chinese yuan should do what? Should drive up the strength of the yuan relative to the U.S. dollar as people uh, bring their dollars into China to build this factory. So what happens? What the uh, Chinese central bank does, and I don't know why they have to say China being China here is a little bit of a editorial comment, but what the Chinese uh, central bank will do is they will go ahead and they will require the banks in those countries to give up their dollars and replace them with Chinese yuan to keep the yuan relatively low relative to the dollar. If we sat there and we bought up all the Chinese yuan with dollars, the what? The number of yuan available would come down. You bring down the supply, the price goes up, right? And so um, if we don't want Chinese imports to be too expensive, um, in the U.S., or if you could look at it as Chinese export, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of China, if they keep the price of the yuan down, that makes their exports relatively uh, cheaper, and so they're not going to uh, to want to drive that up. So they will fix the currency that way. And so there's quite a bit of criticism that hey, you know, they're fixing their currency relative to the U.S. dollar. That's something that we can continue to uh, you know negotiate with uh, China and get better deals in other countries as well. Okay, so you have free floating, you have a pegged or fixed um, interest, I'm uh, not interest rate, but currency exchange rate. In most countries, uh, keep it free floating, although all countries from time to time try to fix the rate, um, you know, whatever with whatever is going on, they all take their turn to try something like that. So it just really depends on what's going on. Okay. Okay, good. So the ratio at which uh, Australian dollars are converted into Indonesian, what is that, rupai, is known as the, and we are talking about exchange rates here, obviously. Okay. U.S. exporters prefer what? Prefer a relatively weak dollar so that those exports will be cheaper in those um other countries and so they'll be able to um, they'll be able to acquire that foreign currency more cheaply and so we want a weak dollar for exporters importers prefer what importers prefer a relatively strong dollar so that we can acquire those uh, other currencies more cheaply and that'll bring down the price of those imports okay Okay, good. Uh, U.S. company exports products to Russia. The price of the U.S. products in Russia are going up because the value of the dollar has what? 
has risen against the Russian currency. Okay, so the price of the U.S. products in Russia go up if what the dollar is relatively strong against the uh, Russian currency. What is it? The ruble? They're saying the Russian currency. Do they call it the ruble still? I don't know what the exactly the currency is, but uh, what happens now? It is going to be more difficult to acquire dollars uh, for the uh, you know Russians to purchase the U.S. products, and so uh, the U.S. products are uh, going are going up in price okay uh, the value of the nation of news export is greater than the value of its imports if the exports are greater than the imports unlike what we have in the US we have a trade surplus right as opposed to a trade deficit US like I said I think I don't know that there's any country that we have a trade surplus with I guess maybe there's some but uh, most of the time you just hear about the deficit okay most companies operate under what under a free floating exchange rate okay it is uh, it is uh, not as common for it to be fixed although as I've said I remember a while back when the German mark was having some issues uh, they their central bank got in this is almost going back about 10 years uh, about almost 20 years ago they got in and uh, did some things to their central bank to try to fix their currency as well so it really depends if there's a crisis going on with something in a country uh, then uh, any central bank will will butt in and take actions to protect their currency okay um, you know some of the challenges uh, that you have to face with uh, remember our topic here international business um, you know for example the policies of the government uh, there's a change you have a relatively friendly government but somehow that changes that could be a problem uh, socioeconomic factors uh, growth and development um, you know one of the things that uh, is happening in um, in Asia now is, is we're, we're not seeing as much of the cheap labor price of labor is going up in some of uh, some of these countries uh, Japan is an aging population that's a factor that you need to think about so all of these demographic issues uh, need to be thought about and obviously uh, cultural issues okay and I don't pick the pictures for these things I don't know about this but uh, we have these issues okay so we think about political legal ethical considerations all right so that I think finishes up chapter four so I want to get us into chapter five now which will be our last chapter before our midterm and um, so let's just go ahead and take it from here okay and uh, what we're going to start to talk about is entrepreneurism uh, small businesses okay and uh, I don't know this chapter I thought when I was looking at this I thought you know that this is something that's pretty good um, for you to think about not so much just from obviously the requirement that you take this in this class but also from the standpoint that um, that uh, you may want to start thinking about hey maybe I'll uh, maybe I'm an entrepreneur maybe I'm somebody that should be starting my own business right okay so what happens um, you deal with small business and let's just get to that and they tell us that uh, small businesses are defined as those that have fewer than 500 employees annual revenue of uh, seven million dollars okay and they start to give you uh, some of the uh, different categories of these in terms of number of employees in this pie chart and I was a little surprised to see you know of the uh, numbers here what uh, you know the large majority I don't know what that percentage comes out to but obviously taking up a lot of that pie is small businesses that have one to four employees so uh, when we talk about businesses falling in this category we're f talking about one to five hundred employees most of them are more in the range of the one than the 500 right okay so uh, pretty small numbers for some of these businesses
Okay. Um, this slide, I could only put a question mark on, and I tried to read what the textbook people said about it. They say that, um, you know, U.S. small businesses generate 64% of net new jobs, create nearly one half of the U.S. gross domestic product, and I was okay with that. Export about one third of all U.S. exports, okay, represent the second largest economy in the world. And I couldn't tie that to this chart because I'm sitting there and I'm saying, well, we're saying U.S. is one, China is two. So U.S. small business looks like three to me. I don't know. I don't get the chart versus um, what we're saying on the slide here. But um, bottom line, what? Obviously, small business in the U.S. is a fairly significant contributor to the worldwide economy, right? I mean, we can certainly take that away um, from this slide, okay? Now, when we take a look at... Uh, some of the uh, huh? I mean, it's if we went by population, China would be up here. So I'm not sure how. I don't know how that's working. That looks like three to me, but I don't know. I don't get the chart, okay? But uh, whether they're two or three, it's fairly significant part of the overall U.S. economy. I mean, uh, overall worldwide economy, right? Okay? So, anyway, um, that's, that's the major takeaway here. But you can see that the point of this whole thing is the U.S. small businesses are uh, significant not only to the U.S., but the worldwide economy. Okay. Now you take a look and uh, some of the things that small businesses do help foster innovation. Okay. You say, well, why is that? Well, one idea being that if you come up with a new idea for a new product or new processes for doing things, what's going to happen? You're probably going to start that in your new business. Okay. So you're going to uh, foster innovation that way. Uh, help bigger companies through supply. There are some things that larger companies don't want to produce because it's just uh, not within their economies of scale. Okay, and it's easier for them to, um, you know, subcontract that work to a smaller business, et cetera. It creates lots of opportunity there. Uh, help consumers, okay, uh, by supplying products that a larger uh, business may not be uh, willing uh, to provide. Okay, so uh, some of the contributions of small businesses. Okay, now uh, if you look at uh, the small business, and they say here that it provides opportunities for women and minorities, and I had to stare at that slide for a while because I'm looking, it's like 80% says white. It seems like it's providing opportunities for white if you look at that pie chart, but um, you could argue at the same time that because you have these uh, minority-owned businesses, this maybe gives opportunities uh, that wouldn't be available elsewhere, I guess is what they're trying to say um, by this slide. And uh, you can see that uh, this trend obviously uh, would be growing uh, hopefully over time. Um, so, uh, you can see that small businesses create about 64% of the new jobs, uh, employ many who do not fit into a traditional corporate structure. Um, sometimes for entrepreneurs, they have trouble fitting in to a corporate structure because everything has to be done what? Has to be done a certain way. Uh, I worked in an entity that was highly structured for years, the federal government, okay? And so, and I happened to work for an agency that actually was uh, fairly uh, innovative in how it allows the employees to uh, contribute to uh, how we do our work, uh, being in an auditing environment, but there were some things that uh, I found were maddening over the years. Why do we have to always uh, do a process a certain way? Um, we used to have process a process on each audit where you had to hit what they called a gate, 
and the gate was what let you go into the next phase of the process. So if you hit your planning gate, you, in order to get into your implementation gate, you had to get past the planning gate. And then if you were going to go into the report writing phase, you had to get past the data gathering gate. And we used to call them fences because we felt they're not really gates, they're fences that you have to get through to be able to uh, complete the audit. So sometimes for entrepreneurial types, those type of structures are uh, very, very um, uh, limiting. And this is what causes an entrepreneur to say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start my own business. Um, in my CPA review business that I've been involved in uh, as a contractor for years, um, we have this issue of pricing and that the company wants the price to every customer to be exactly the same. And uh, they're doing that because they don't want to run into an issue where one customer is hearing about a better price than another customer. But often uh, what will happen is there'll be a group that wants a group discount on the price of the course. And so we bring in and we have the opportunity to bring in a group from, say, a particular university or something that wants to work out a deal where they would be a little cheaper price. And they can't do that because headquarters always says, no, we don't want to get into the business of offering the product at different prices, et cetera. So um, there were some individuals that got tired of that and they started their own uh, business okay guys this is not the place to sleep if you're that tired go back home and you know catch up on your sleep and come back next time uh, when you feel a little better okay okay so what happens um, we create uh, so this uh, will uh, provide different opportunities uh, for individuals who maybe don't fit into the traditional corporate structure okay Okay, good. So reasons to start a new business, okay? Opportunity for innovation. You have an idea and you just want to uh, make that your business. Control, again, with business decisions, pricing, etc. Schedule flexibility and they have, I don't know if you can read these little blocks, say work, life balance, I guess, is what we're looking for here. And maybe starting your own business provides a, a more flexible schedule for that. I guess that can be the case. I'm of the opinion that if you start your own business, you are, that business becomes your baby or whatever, okay? It becomes very hard uh, to really do anything else but run your uh, own small business. So I guess maybe you have some flexibility and that you're able to do work from midnight until, you know, six in the morning or something, and then you can have, you know, parts, other parts of your day free. But, uh, you know, owning your own business to me, and uh, maybe you have some different experience, but to me it's almost like a 24-7 endeavor for you. Okay, uh, financial independence, um, owners feel that they can make more money by operating their own business, and um, hey, it's uh, something that uh, sometimes people are forced into their own business uh, because of, uh, you know, being laid off from a particular job, unemployment being a driving factor, okay? Do you guys just want to go home and look at these slides on your own? Is that where, what's happening, or? because I just don't want to get into a thing where I'm talking to a bunch of bobbing heads. So if you prefer to read the slides on your own, you could do that. Okay. Okay. So what happens? The impact of technology uh, on small business. And to me, the big technological drive here is the Internet. Okay. The Internet is something that is making it easier to deliver products, to market your product. Um for example, in the education industry now, what happens? Very few people want to come to a live class for some sorts of uh, in education, particularly the CPA review, et cetera, because you can provide that particular product so easily over the Internet now, and the cost of that is going down. Uh, you look at something like this software that I'm using, this Camtasia software is what is a major, uh, for me, is a major um, 
way that uh, technology is making it easier to deliver lectures, that sort of thing, uh, for educational purposes. Uh, and then the ability to put all that data on. I don't even know how YouTube does that. How do they you know, let all of that data go up there? They must have some sort of servers that allow them through Google, I guess, that allow them to do that. But that, to me, again, is another uh, technological uh, impact that could drive the start of a uh, small business. I think internet being the major one. Um, impact of social media, making it much easier now uh, to advertise. You don't have to pay for radio advertising or television advertising. Um, you can get a lot of uh, a lot of impact uh, through through Facebook and all those sort of different uh, social media that's available. Any thoughts on technology helping small business? How you how would you would use technology to start a small business? Not that you have to give up give up your trade secret here, but yes, sir. Right. Right. Selling things on eBay um, again, uh, leveraging off the internet to a large extent, but. Um, you obviously don't have to carry, uh, have a physical store, so you're saving a lot of cost there, and that then increases the the popularity. Anything else? Other ways? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, entrepreneurs, traits, uh, innovative. Okay, innovative. Um, you know, coming up with better ways to do things, better products, okay, better ways to price the product, all of these things are innovation. Uh, risk takers, okay, obviously entrepreneurs are risk takers and we're going to be talking about uh, this, the failure rate for small businesses pretty, here, pretty soon here. So when you get into the idea of starting your own business, you are definitely uh, falling into the category of a risk taker. Um, motivated to succeed okay now that doesn't mean that if you don't become an entrepreneur you're not motivated to succeed but without that uh, I think that you're going to have uh, difficulty uh, being successful and I've already talked about the long hours associated with uh, you know starting your own business um, to me though you could also include with this motivated to succeed is a generally positive outlook is a very important part of this what happens you get involved in something like this you're going to have some rocky innings and some rocky seas out there right and if you panic and say oh you know this isn't working out the way I'm gonna let it go um, you're going to uh, you know you're going to uh, you know no matter how motivated to succeed you are, I guess, you're going to have to be able to what see your way through some more difficult times if you're starting a business. So I think a generally positive attitude could be rolled into motivated to succeed. Uh, flexible, okay? Uh, the ability to change if there are changes in um, the environment, okay? Uh, work well with others um, this is a big one too and some of these maybe you know go against each other a little bit and that if you're motivated to succeed do you really work well with others you know sometimes individuals that are motivated to succeed can have the mistake of rolling over others of insisting that those others be just as motivated as they are and everyone comes with a different motivation right and I'm sure we've all been in a situation where there's that annoying over motivated person right that is saying oh well let's do this and we can try that. and it's like okay take a chill pill right and those sorts of things and so you know those are uh, some of these things things uh, tend to uh, counter against each other a little bit, right? Okay. I mean, we talk about flexible here, but we also put next to that being what? Being self-directed. Well, if you're too self-directed, then what? Maybe you're not so flexible, right? So some of these uh, 
uh, keys that we're looking for in terms of success for entrepreneurs. When I look at this list, I think to myself, well, some of these things can actually work against each other, right? And uh, so uh, an entrepreneur has to be smart enough, skilled enough to really know how to counterbalance some of these things, okay? Uh, system thinkers, okay? System thinkers looking at a process and seeing how it can be improved or thinking how to, uh, you know, go about accomplishing the task in a very systematic, uh, organized manner. So all of these things um, are things that are um, some things that entrepreneurs, skills that entrepreneurs would have. Okay, so you may look at that list and you may see something in yourself, right, that you think you could uh, use as a strength. I had a, uh, I had a uh, boss one time that uh, somebody made a comment to me that, and you guys maybe have seen this. I haven't done as much writing in this class, but they said, John, you know, your writing is so sloppy. We have trouble reading your notes that you put down in there, you know, can you write a little bit neater? And so I talked to my boss about that and I said, well, maybe I should get some penmanship classes and that kind of thing. And he was like, hang on a minute, you know, I'm don't work on weaknesses, work on building up strengths and work to mitigate your weaknesses as much as you can, right? And so uh, his comment to me being, just be careful when you write. Don't go take a penmanship class. Be careful when you write. Make sure that, you know, you're making your notes legibly and continue to build up your strength of having good analysis skills, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, again, you know, you probably look to some of these some of these areas where you may have strength and if you don't have strength in some of these areas then your goal is to what is to try to mitigate the extent that you have some risks there okay um, do you just want to go ahead and 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 leave the class so you can get some rest you sure okay because I just don't want someone if they're feeling sick or something like that to feel like they need to stay here okay okay good so Let's just come over then and take a look at uh, types of entrepreneurs, okay? We have uh, lifestyle entrepreneurs. They get into their own business because they want to de dedicate their, uh, the way their lifestyle works. Micro entrepreneurs are those that like to get into a lot of different small endeavors. Home-based entrepreneurs, uh, those that are working out of their homes. Uh, internet entrepreneurs, uh, like those individuals using eBay, that sort of thing. Growth entrepreneurs are usually, uh, actually micro entrepreneurs and growth entrepreneurs, I misspoke on micro, uh, micro and growth. Some micro entrepreneurs want to keep things small. They have no desire to have this gigantic business that will someday be the largest this or the greatest that. They simply want to have a small firm that they can handle the work in and they sit there and they go through and uh, do their processes. Uh, for example, uh, I know a few individuals who have small CPA firms and that's their goal is to have small CPA firms. They have enough work that they themselves can handle in terms of doing taxes and doing uh, audits and review services for bookkeeping and that sort of thing. And they have no desire to go out and hire, you know, 50 more employees and take on, you know, 100 audits a year or something like that. They just want to take on enough projects during the year that they can handle. So that's a micro entrepreneur as opposed to someone that's saying, well, I want to be the number one provider of this product within 10 years or something like that or I want to grow my business from one employee just me in my garage you know not these are not uh, mutually exclusive to what uh, to um, you know a, a multi-state business with uh, offices across the country okay uh, intrapreneurs are individuals that still work for their employer but they like to be involved in coming up with a lot of different new ideas for products for processes that sort of thing and really depending on what sort of company you work in you can have a lot of opportunity for that sort of thing if the company is structured in such a way where your ideas can bubble up and uh, be considered okay uh, social 
uh, entrepreneurs, social uh, entrepreneurs, again, using uh, social media, that sort of thing, um, to build the, their business. Serial entrepreneurs are the individuals that like to start a lot of different um, different types of businesses. Uh, uh, businesses so they all have several different businesses that they may start up uh, in different uh, different probably similar industries but still start up a lot of different businesses within that and then entrepreneurial teams will bring individuals together with different backgrounds and disciplines to uh, help develop a new business a new product okay so different types of entrepreneurs Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple questions here. Which of the following is a best example of entrepreneurial innovation um, launching the first Starbucks store? Okay, not, uh, not necessarily, you know, getting a franchise like we'll talk about in a minute. But if you're launching the first Starbucks store, that's an entrepreneur probably – uh, most people didn't think that people would be willing to wait in line for coffee being produced at you know at a little uh, little coffee shop like that. Okay, uh, expanding a landscaping to serve more clients is not going to be an example of entrepreneur. That's growing uh, your business, buying a McDonald's or a Starbucks franchise. I don't know. Do they franchise those Starbucks, or are they all owner operate? Are all uh, operate they do franch, uh, franchise them okay um, okay so different things here but launching the first and I think the key word in this example is what first Starbucks is an example of entrepreneurial innovation doing something different okay uh, let's take a look at this uh, sort of situational question Amy is a founder of a small IT firm that specializes in in social networking applications she meets weekly with the members of her development team to solicit their ideas address any problems they're having and provide motivation and encouragement Amy is demonstrating what leadership and communication skills do we have that on the slide I guess I don't see oh here hello good leadership skills right okay again I'm looking at this and maybe it's just my bad attitude but I don't know if I want to work for Amy right because sometimes you might sit there and say oh, here comes Amy again with one of her motivational speeches right so again it's good to have you know this good motivation where is it good leadership skills motivation um, being motivated to succeed but does that get in the way of working well with others right so again you want to consider the trade-off uh, between these different things okay okay good let's take a look at this one which statement best describes why a successful entrepreneur needs to be flexible answer here entrepreneurial ventures um, involve risky situations and unexpected events right so you can't be locked in on one way or one idea especially is and and what happens in any business endeavor I have a uh, a friend who tried to start up his own course for CPA review it flopped okay they flopped and part of the reason they flopped my opinion they you know got some loans from the small business administration and that and next thing I knew they started showing up with like new cars <laughs> and I'm like okay um, so you got to be careful with your debt load and your financing and what you're doing with that etc but um, you know they had some difficulties and the business flopped and so they went to work for another review course after they left the one they were with to start up their own and that flopped so they went back to work for another one and he kept saying if I knew now what I knew then I would have etc right so what happens no matter what business you get into you're going to run into uh, growth into learning right and so you're going to be learning as you go along and that learning then is going to cause you to want to adapt to the changes in the situation right so um, you know the question becomes can you learn fast enough as uh, you start to really get into it's one thing to sit there 
and think about a business, doing that business is probably a whole nother, uh, a whole nother project, right? Okay, lifestyle entrepreneurs want what? Flexibility and freedom in the way they balance their personal and work lives. And again, the real thing I see, you know, it makes it sound like, well, I was working, you know, uh, eight hours a day. And now I only work two hours a day because I started my own business. It's probably more like what? I was working eight hours a day from nine to five. Now I work 12 hours a day from 12 noon to midnight and I'm able to take my kids to school or something like that. But uh, I just want to, you know, I think sometimes people when they see this and oh boy, you know, it's really fun to own your own business. It is fun, but uh, it's not an issue of uh, cut back on hours or just sitting around, you know, it's going to probably be an awful lot of work. Um, okay. Okay, good. Which of the following types of entrepreneurs does not become involved in starting his or, home, or his or her own business? It's the intrapreneur, right, who is trying to bring their um, ideas of innovation, etc., to whatever uh, company they're working for. And again, um, my opinion, that's a function of how open the employer is to that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you could have all these great ideas and it's not until, you know, you've uh, had your, you know, 10th good idea shot down that you realize that they don't want to hear your good ideas anymore. And that might be when you want to do something else. Okay. Huh? It can be bad too from the standpoint of the employer, you mean? Yeah, if they have all these crazy ideas constantly. Yeah, that's true, too. Sometimes the employer starts to get annoyed, right? So, I mean, the thing that's nice about an environment where at least you can have some control in that is you kind of get the best of both worlds, right? You get the security of the job, but you also get opportunity from time to time to see your, in our office, we used to call them office improvement projects that you could come up with ideas of how to improve processes. I never had any that actually got implemented that I can think of, but um, a lot of times what happens is you may have a good idea and you try to float it and you try to institutionalize it and no one pays attention until what? Until you start having success that is, um, you know, unquestioned and then they start to want to know how do you do that how can we get other people to be able to do that as well right so sometimes uh, you kind of lead uh, silently and it's your success that starts to get people to uh, pay attention to some of the things that you're doing and so I mentioned that in that uh, some of my teaching methods for my CPA review um, over a year over the years people started doing those things because they were successful and the students were being successful in passing the exam etc and so individuals started uh, started doing the same things that I was doing not because I said hey you ought to do this but because uh, I was having success with it now if you're the person that's being tapped that way sometimes it's a little bit hard because you start saying well I don't want to give up all of my secrets to somebody else and that's a tough one uh, to get over okay and so sometimes uh, you know you may be forced into an entrepreneur uh, opportunity position even though uh, you may not want to uh, necessarily share all your secrets with that but that's something that I think you should get over as soon as possible okay it's a natural feeling to have that but I think the more of this you start to do uh, the more successful you're going to find yourself in even if you don't start your own business or whatever. Okay. Okay, good. Franchises. Okay. Um, we have the uh, franchisor and the franchisee. Is that how you spell franchise -er? I think it's franchise or O R. I'm pretty sure is the way that should be said. It's I don't think I think the person we have two people. We have the franchisee, the franchisor. The franchisor is McDonald's. Is um, you ever seen this Auntie Anne's pretzel place? 
right? You go to the shopping mall and you see this big line of people lined up, you know, and you're saying, well, geez, what are they doing? Giving something away there? And you get a little closer and you realize it's people lined up to buy a pretzel for $4, right flour and water rolled up in the shape of a pretzel four dollars right and you sit there and you say why am i sitting here studying so hard taking classes college classes and working hard to get my degree i'll just buy an anti in uh, franchise and just all i got to do is roll up flour and water and i'll make a fortune right and so what happens in that scenario anti in is the franchisor and you would be the franchisee Okay, and so you might call her up and say, hey, what do I got to do to get in this business? And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, give us $50,000. I'm just making this number up. I don't know what it is. Give us $50,000, and for that $50,000, we'll tell you, we'll let you hang up the Auntie Anne pretzel sign. And then they also give you some advice. For example, we'll tell you where to put the Auntie Anne franchise, which is the best place to draw pretzel eaters, whatever, right? Now, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. And the, the ultimate example of franchise, of course, is McDonald's, right? Um, and I've seen before where you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden you look in the middle of nowhere, there's a McDonald's and you think to yourself, why on earth would they put a McDonald's right there, right? Then what happens? You come by two years later and there's a whole city that grew up around that McDonald's and you're like, geez, you know, people came from all over to be next to that McDonald's. No, McDonald's knew that what? Uh, that was the place to put that franchise because of the growth uh, around that area, whatever. Okay, and so uh, these are the type of services that the franchisor, say McDonald's, Auntie Anne, would provide to the franchisee. Okay, and that fifty thousand dollars is something that we call an initial franchise fee and it's something that you pay up front and then uh, you're able to uh, to sort of get your foot into this business okay now we come over and some advantages um, you know proven system of operation strength in numbers training is almost always part of the deal what happens let's say you get the anti in and you don't know how to fold the pretzel into a pretzel shape. You can get a square, you get a circle, can't get a pretzel. I don't know if you've ever watched them do this. It's this weird thing. I guess it's all in the wrist where they just throw the thing and it turns into a pretzel. And so you sit there and you say, uh, how do you do this? No problem. We'll charge, we'll charge you 5% of revenue and we'll come in and train you month to month how to make the pretzels or whatever it is, right? Okay, marketing support is provided. I mean, uh, I can't watch TV for, you know, especially during a football season and that for more than what, more than one commercial break. Here comes McDonald's commercial, right? And so what happens? You're benefiting from that marketing campaign, right? Okay, um, some disadvantages, um, you know, lack of complete control. You got to make the milkshakes a certain way. Right, got to make the fries because they got to be McDonald's fries. Now everyone's going to be stopping at McDonald's on the way home, right? McDonald's fries got to make them a certain way, okay? Uh, workload is no less, still like owning your own business. Um, competition and cannibalizing. You open up a McDonald's here, and then you look across the street the next day, there's one over there, right? And they don't give any consideration as to distance and the uh, potential for uh, competition, okay? All right, so some of the pros and cons of franchises, okay? So some ways to know what's going on. This slide is a little bit hard, but uh, questions to ask of the franchise or, or, and they got it right this time, franchise or, and what questions to ask about the franchise ask other franchisees so you say hey uh, i'm thinking of opening up uh auntie and pretzel does she really teach you how to fold the pretzels or do you have to just sort of figure it out yourself right because auntie Anne may be telling you oh yes we provide you with support and training and we'll be there and then turns out not really right and you're pretty much on your own to figure things out when you talk to a franchisee so this is a nice little list of things uh, to think about before buying in Okay, uh, you could buy 
an existing business. Okay, you could buy an existing business. Um, pros, ease of startup, existing customer base, uh, financing opportunities. Sometimes the owner will say, look, you take over the business and all I want is a percent of the revenues and um, you know you give me a hundred thousand up front or something like that right so that's really a financing opportunity uh, cons could be a high purchase price inheriting the previous owners mistakes unknowns in transition that's probably the biggest one uh, I used to go to this restaurant all the time that was run by um, a husband and wife the uh, wife was the waitress and the husband did all the cooking and uh, they were, you know, pretty decent restaurant. You know, I probably would go there once a month, maybe maybe twice a month, whatever. And they sold it, and they sold the recipe book and everything. They sold it to new owners because they decided that they were ready to retire. Their kids were through college and that, and they were going to go ahead and enjoy the good life, whatever, right? So they sold it to different owners, different, uh, same menu, same place, the whole thing, right? But what happened? It, what I realized, because I went there a couple times with the new owners, and it just didn't feel the same. There was nothing wrong with the new owners, but what maybe the, and that place went out of business after that, and maybe what the new owners didn't consider what it was the personality of those individuals that were there, right? It was the idea that what that they brought a certain feel to that restaurant, that it felt like you were eating at their house or something, that the new owners couldn't produce that uh, without having those years of having you know developed a customer base etc so you know an unknown in transition is maybe where's Bob Bob used to always be the one to serve me what happened right so maybe something you think about is you keep Bob around for a little while longer until you develop relationship with those customers etc and that might ease the transition okay so just some uh, things to think about. Due diligence, okay? Uh, why is the business for sale? What do the customers say? Are there opportunities for growth? Who's the competition? Due diligence checklist. Get an independent evaluation of inventory and equipment. Have an accountant review the financial statements for the past three years, okay? Um, now when they talk about a review, I don't know if they mean an actual what we call a review. Okay, review is a highly technical term for CPAs. It means that you provide certain procedures over those financial statements, uh, which is uh, not uh, not may or may not be an audit. Okay, I'm thinking that depending on the nature of the business, you'd probably uh, want an audit. Audit goes further than a review. Okay, Audit is more intensive than a review, so maybe what they meant to put here is the word audit, where you will have somebody come in and look at those financial statements and independently give you a report that the financial statements are fairly stated. Okay, and you may want that level of involvement. Sometimes you can sit there and direct the activities of the accountant. They call that agreed upon procedures, where you go in and you tell the accountant, you know, all I really want you to do is check the cash receipts on this business. I want you to see that if they said that they received a certain amount of cash, I want you to see that that was deposited into a bank or something like that. And the CPA will come in and say, yes, we saw that the deposits because you're interested in the cash receipts because you look at it and it's a highly cash leverage business and you want to see that they actually are generating the amount of cash that they want to. Uh, I had a student years ago who told me that she was thinking of buying a laundromat. And she wanted to know if I had any suggestions as to how she could get a comfort level as to how they were generating their revenue or how much revenue they said they were generating. Was there something that she could look at? She wasn't going to be able to hire an accountant to come in and look at it. Something that she could look at that would help her to validate what they were saying with the revenue was. What do you think we came up with? to see that the revenue that was being generated by the laundromat seemed reasonable. He said, huh? Get the utility bills, get the water bill, and get the 
electricity bill and see if that supports the revenue. Look, if they're only using a thousand gallons of water a year, then that's probably not a very successful laundromat because I don't know of any other way of washing laundry other than through what with water, right? So we suggested, hey, get that water bill, take a look at it, and see if that seems reasonable. In fact, you can probably figure out pretty close to what the revenue should be, at least on the washing machine part of it, by saying, well, look, they use you know, 100,000 gallons of water. I don't know what they use in a laundromat. You use this much water. Each load of laundry uses, what, two gallons of water. That's 50,000 loads. If they charge $3 per gallon, you should be able to come up with the washing machine revenue should be about $150,000, shouldn't it? So you should be able to come pretty close to that. And that's pretty much, then you could back that into, what? Uh, well, that's a certain amount of cash then, because I don't know of anybody that, you know, does a receivable for laundry, okay? So all of these things are the kinds of things um, that you may want to uh, take a look at. Have a lawyer analyze any issues going on with the business, etc. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, regardless of how well a poorly, uh, how well or poorly a franchise business is doing, franchisees must give the franchisor a uh, royalty fee, okay? Uh, they're going to charge you a royalty. They're probably going to say, up front, you got to pay us, you know, $100,000 for the McDonald's, and then we're going to take 5% of the revenue, something like that, right? Okay, that's usually how those work. Okay, in determining the value of existing, by the way, Again, with these franchises, um, I've heard stories of people that buy McDonald's and they think it's going to just be a money-making machine. And what happens? It doesn't make money. They're spending, you know, they're spending 15, 18 hours a day there, you know, trying to make the French fries cook right. And, you know, it becomes a big deal. So, and then you got to cough up what? A chunk of any revenue off of it. So it's not like it's just a money making machine. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, in determining the value of existing businesses, one of the potential sources of value is the owner's goodwill. In this case, goodwill refers to, I don't know, guys, I guess I picked this question because I'm an accountant, and so it jumped out at me. Oh, they're talking about intangible assets here. Intangible assets are assets that have value that is not obvious just by looking at a asset. Like the value of this desk, I can pretty much say is what? What would you put on it? 50 bucks, 60 bucks, I don't know, $200, I don't know. But you can look at that and you can pretty much decide what the value of it is by looking. It's in pretty good condition. The swivel part seems to be working. Look out. Whatever, right? <laughs> so what happens? You sit there and you can pretty much appraise that value by looking at it, right? An intangible asset, you can't do that. What happens? The patent, for example, to use the touchscreen technology on the iPhone is written on a piece of paper somewhere, right, that they have that patent. But you can't look at that piece of paper and say, well, that is now worth this much because they're going to be able to produce these many iPhones, etc., right? So those are considered intangible. Goodwill is the probably the most intangible of intangible assets because of what? It's just floating out there, and you can't really see it. So you have to almost feel it more, don't you? Okay, and so what happens? That uh, example that I gave of that restaurant, there was goodwill there that was just sort of floating around in the air, wasn't it? Okay, and what? You didn't realize that until you were, unless you were actually sitting in there and you were a regular customer. But not only that, it was something that disappeared as soon as those individuals were gone and the individuals, uh, the customers were sitting in the seat saying, hey, where's, I forget what their name was, where's so-and-so, where's so-and-so, what happened? Gee, you know, the food is still good, but something's missing now, right? That intangible asset of goodwill, okay? So uh, that sources of value uh, that the current owners may have that uh, may be difficult for you to continue. Or you know what? You could go in 
and you have this nice restaurant and that and people like it and then it takes one bad thing to happen right that uh, destroys the goodwill for you so okay okay good now notice small businesses fail and notice guys I don't know what all these colors are oh the different years but notice that what happens it uh, drops off pretty quick here and then it what the longer you make it the more opportunity that you're gonna have for success right okay so uh, but a very sharp decline here in the earlier years some of the problems accumulating too much debt inadequate management poor planning um, and then the uh, unanticipated personal sacrifices to me is a big one. Okay, so if you're planning to start a new business, how long should you realistically expect to take for your business to earn a profit? And we're saying what, three to five years here? Okay, so that means you're going to have to have some sort of financing or personal capital that's going to allow you to get through that period, right? Otherwise, you're going to have to go find a regular job. Uh, well, if you're losing money, you don't really have to worry about taxes, right? And uh, one of the things that you're hearing about Trump right now is that he took this uh, billion, almost a billion dollar loss um, in 1992 or three or something like that and um, what the tax law says is that you can carry that loss two years back and you can carry it 18 years forward um, huh yeah the tax law is such that they let you take an, uh, an operating loss and they let you they call it a loss carry forward and they let you carry it forward for I think it's somewhere in the teens. I think it's 18 years. So you can carry it back against previous year's income, but you can carry it forward. And that whole idea is designed for a, you know, to support small businesses or also to support a situation where you have just a bad year, right? And we're trying to help the recovery go along. And so they'll allow you to carry those losses forward. And so you can shield future year's income against that uh, against that loss that you have in this year and I think there's a limitation to how much you could take in any one year but for a small business it's a very large amount okay so they call that a carry forward and uh, what Trump is saying is well see how smart I am I know how to use the tax laws to avoid paying taxes so I'm pretty smart And he's talking about how bad the economy was in the 90s Meanwhile, what he doesn't talk about, everybody says the early 90s, the economy had a very bad recession. And what nobody talks about is who was coming out of office in the late 80s going into the 90s. Reagan was president. So everyone says, oh, Reagan was so great of a president. Meanwhile, what happens? We came out of one of the worst recessions we've had coming out of the 80s. And then Bush, the father, was the one that took over in the 90s. That's part of the reason that he didn't get uh, reelected. And then uh, Trump is sitting there saying, well, all we kept saying was uh, survive until 95. That's all we're trying to do. Well, who became president in 90? What, six? Was Clinton's husband, Bill Clinton, became the president, and the economy took off after that. So nobody's talking about that part of it. But uh, anyway, you can carry those losses forward uh, into future years if you, have, if you have that. But again, if you can kind of make it into here, your chances of success are a lot... Uh, lot uh, of surviving or a lot a lot higher okay okay now um, let's take a look at business plan okay business plan is something that uh, you know can have all sort of different levels and you can actually get help with the business plan okay so you'll have your basic company information your marketing plan your operational plan, your financial plan, okay, big deal for somebody like me. They have what they call financial, prospective financial statements. You can get a financial forecast. You can get a financial projection 
Financial forecast is something that you can use to get general investing uh, opportunities, get investing from general sources. A projection is a, usually you're, you're negotiating directly with a bank or something like that to get a loan. But both of these are uh, considered financial forecast, financial projections are considered um, prospective financial statements, doing a risk analysis, okay? Um, you know, in this operational plan, they say staffing, research, develop, manufacturing plan, IT plan, and then they kind of link that to the financial plan. But I think they should be a little bit more explicit here in terms of exactly what is going to be your financial accounting system, what is going to be your system. For example, you could have a great business, a great product, etc. You're generating a lot of sales and if you don't have a system in place for your receivables, you're going to have trouble collecting on that, right? Okay, and this is often what ends up hurting businesses is they don't have a good process for what they call backroom processes for billing your customers, for making sure that you're collecting. If you're going to issue credit, what are you going to need to do if you're going to issue credit for customers? You want to issue credit to your customers. Do you just want to be a cash business or are you going to let them pay you later, right? Huh? Yes. You're going to have an account for them, but you may be before you offer them an account and a receivable and do that bookkeeping process, you're going to want to have some way of evaluating their credit worthiness first, right? So maybe you're going to have to institute a way to do a credit check on these individuals, etc. So they kind of don't get into that here too much, uh, but that to me is probably one of the key elements of uh, having a successful business is making sure your payable process is going on. Uh, if you have distributors that are offering you discounts if you pay within a certain period of time, well, you want to make sure that you're maximizing those discounts and that you're taking advantage of the discounts that are useful to you. Somebody may give you a discount, but you'd be ba better off w if you pay early, but you'd be better off waiting until the bill is due because you could get a better return if you invested that money somewhere, right? Right? So all of these things, uh, I guess they're rolling into financial plan, but I don't think so. I think you know, it should really be operational plan and something that you definitely would need to think about. The tax considerations, right? There may be some tax planning that goes into this as well. Okay, good. Now, there are a lot of uh, sources of help and information. Uh, Small Business Administration, you can even visit their website. Um, they help small businesses. They also have uh, some, um, you know, uh, specific uh, programs aimed at certain demographics. Um, so that may be something to look at as well. If, you know, maybe they have one that's for, you know, um, children of the East Bay. I don't know, but take a look at that, and there may be something that um, that may be helpful with that as well. Okay, um, National Business Incubators Association is one that I want to point out here. I don't know that Ohlone College has one or not, but they may very well. This is something that is often at the universities, at two-year, four-year colleges in which they uh, bring together various alumni, that sort of thing, that help individuals at a particular institution uh, to you know, get started in business and help provide support and advice and that sort of thing. And if it's not here at Ohlone, I'm sure it's at another uh, one of the colleges in the area, say maybe San Jose State. I'll bet you, I'll bet you a buck San Jose State's got to have one. Okay, being right there in the heart of Silicon Valley the way they are. And so, but still, the connection between Ohlone and San Jose State may be something you want to take a look at. But anyway, these different organizations that if you have an idea, it's not like you have to sit there and just sort of figure it all out for yourself. They have these different organizations that you can go to for help. Okay. Financing considerations, bootstrap financing, personal savings, uh, crowdfunding. I don't know about this borrowing from family and friends, guys. They always put that up on these kinds of things, and I'm just like, who does that? I don't know. I guess you could go to your family and your friends and, 
I guess it's not, it just doesn't seem. But anyway, uh, what crowdfunding? You get different funding credit cards. Although watch the interest rates on those. Small business loans, as I mentioned, small business administration. Sometimes there's grants for particular things. Um, I know that for the uh, captioning, for example. Um, there's a grant that comes down to the federal government that provides money to companies to do captioning for uh, educational purposes, that sort of thing. Okay, so all of these different things you could look into. Okay, which of the following is not true of business incubators? Um, the Small Business Administration is not a business incubator. That's a private group of individuals. SBA is a federal agency, right? And so they don't have uh, incubators. However, they do have loans and that sort of thing. Okay. To qualify for a Small Business Administration program and benefits specifically targeted for small business, a business must generally have fewer than 20 employees. That's false. That is not true. Okay, can be of different sizes. Doesn't have to be fewer than small, uh, fewer than 20. Okay, um, fewer than 500, however, is correct. Okay, Jody owns a business and designing creates lingerie in an effort to get her product into as many stores as possible. Jody has been uh, lenient on the terms of collection. Allowing stores at least 30 days credit. I don't think that that's so lenient. 30 days is kind of standard. But anyway, as a result, it is taking her too long to collect payments and she has inadequate cash flow. What is the most likely cause for Jody's business difficulty? Jody is not adequately managing the financial aspects of her business. And that was sort of my point. The receivables, how are you going to allow discounts, right? One of the things that she could have done is put into a discount to something called 210 net 30, which means I'll give you 2% discount if you pay me in 10 days. And if you not, you pay the whole amount in 30 days, whatever. Okay, I think that uh, she was mistaken if she thought she was going to get by, you know, just with a 30 day credit. I mean, to me, that's kind of standard uh, amount of time to allow for a, for a credit. But anyway, these are clearly things and this is the kind of stuff that nobody thinks about when they're thinking about starting a business. Right. Okay. And so uh, you really and it may not be a bad idea to go to an accounting firm and ask them for their advice on how to, to set that whole thing up, right? And you could do that, and uh, depending on the, um, the complexity, you may be able to have that done for a reasonable fee. Which the following should a business owner uh, create monthly financial statements? Definitely, I don't know about budgets on a monthly basis, but you might do a annual budget anyway and then divide it by 12 or something and uh, but you definitely need some sort of uh, budget to allow as a plan to see how you're doing against your uh, your budget okay all right so we pretty much covered these things here um, any questions on any of that Okay, so what we're going to do next time is I'm going to put up, I'll probably put about our, our uh, midterm is going to be not next time, but the time after that, right? And it's going to be a 30 question, multi, uh, 30 multiple choice question midterm. We're going to take it on the Scantron. Okay, so what I'm going to have us do next time is sit here and I'll put together 30 questions that come from chapters 1 through 5. I'll put those up on Canvas and um, I'll try to get them up no later than Monday. So you have a chance to look at those in advance and you can, um, what time does this class get out anyway? It's 1030, right? Yeah, okay. So I feel like we always kind of get bummed rushed out of here at the end. Um, but anyway, um, it is going to what? Uh, it's going to be uh, available starting um, probably Monday. Okay, Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and you can go ahead and look at that. I recommend you print it, bring it with you. We'll go through it together so that you can make some notations, etc., on it. And I think that combined with the slides for the first five chapters, which also have questions embedded in them, is going to be a, a good source for your study material. If you're good at these questions and the ones we're going to look at, you should be successful on the midterm, which will be the time after next on the 18th. 
Okay. All right, guys. I. Huh? Yeah, I would look for it Monday evening. It's, I always have so many things going on. It's hard for me to do it sooner. If I can, I will. But it always ends up being. Huh? Yeah, sooner is better, but um, that's not the reality of my life, unfortunately. So I will do my best, though, to get it up sooner. Okay, guys. Thanks for your patience. We will see you next week.